commencement speakers here at the journalism school are always selected by students who over the years have shown remarkably good taste and impeccable judgment. Today we'll be joined by Michael, Michael Barbaro. Michael is the creator of the New York Times' phenomenally successful podcast, The Daily. How many of you are regular listeners? Uh, well, the rest of you should be. Um, it is an extraordinary, it's become part of my daily diet of listening, and it is a, it's, it's an amazing achievement. Um, Michael joined the Times in 2005. He had covered a variety of things, Walmart, City Hall, and national politics. And then before he got into covering national politics, uh, or rather, got into uh, uh, covering Donald Trump. And he succeeded in getting Trump to demand that uh, Barbaro be um, fired uh, over an article he did on Trump's behavior toward women before he acceded to the White House. Um, the idea that the Times might launch a podcast was born during the 2016 election with something called the run-up. And the Daily was launched in January 2017. It, its success was, uh, was immediate. Uh, it became the most downloaded new show on Apple Podcasts in 2017, with five million listeners a month, more than a million of whom tune in every day. Uh, now Vanity Fair estimates it's making the Times eight-figure money. The Daily draws on the quality and experience of the Times' global newsroom of 1,450 journalists, airs on more than 30 radio stations across the country, and won the 2017 DuPont Columbia University Award for Audio Excellence. Uh, in the meantime, Michael himself has become one of the most fond over celebrities of the audio journalism explosion. I pulled some of his clips, and I'm just amazed. I didn't know these media could be so kind. Um, Vanity Fair, uh, quote, his on the shrink's couch cadence, his whispery intros, his perfectly flummoxed moments, his signature bespectacled Wesleyan chic look. <laughs> I'm not sure how much being a Wes misdescribed as Wesleyan, how much of a compliment that is to a Yaley. Um, Michael was quickly becoming the Ira Glass of his generation, which came as a surprise to me because I thought Ira Glass was of your generation, but <laughs> now from the New Yorker, Rebecca Mead. Oh, how are we doing here? You're getting a little soggy, huh? <laughs> oh dear, there are a couple, uh, couple of uh, uh, umbrellas right there, and, uh, and we have a, a variety. A lot of ponchos would be passed out. So if you're getting, if you're getting wet. So Rebecca Mead, the New Yorker, is companionable, confiding, and congenial. Spending 20 minutes with Barbaro has become a necessary daily practice like meditation, but with hair raising breaking news instead of mindfulness. In Barbaro's hands, or rather in Barbaro's voice, the Times becomes conversational and intimate instead of inky and cumbersome. The ultimate compliment, according to an unnamed Times person, the paper, the Times, is exploring ways to replicate Barbaro not just through texts, but also by a voice model similar to Amazon's Alexa, so that maybe you could actually interact and maybe even be friends with Michael Barbaro. I'm very glad he's here. This is his second visit to the J School. We regard him as a friend already, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Michael Barbaro. Okay, thank you. Wow. Okay, I think everybody should take a moment and figure out this rain for themselves. And just... Adjust your umbrellas. I'm, I'm sorry that the rain has come at this moment. Um, but the reality is this place is such a precise journalism school that I was told it would literally begin to rain the moment I took the stage. 
I, w I will attempt to be brief in accommodation of this rain. Um, I want to start off by saying good morning and thank you to all of you, especially Dean Wasserman for those really wonderful introductory remarks, to the faculty, to the alumni, to the parents, to the spouses, the significant others, the partners, the grandparents, the children, and above all to you, the UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism class of 2019. It's very standard to say how honored you are to speak at a commencement, but I'm not doing it just to be polite. I, I need to tell you just how honored I am. I have told everyone I know, and a lot of people I don't even know, that I would be giving this commencement speech. I told people on the plane on the way over. I told people at the ferry building across from my hotel in San Francisco. I told the person who helped me print this speech out this morning in my hotel. Oh, do you want to know why I'm printing this out? Um, two million listeners a day, fine. That's great. Podcast, great. Commencement speech at the Berkeley J School, that is when you know you have arrived. <laughs> which, which tells you a little bit about how, how shallow I am, but <laughs> it, it should really tell you something about the place of this institution in the public imagination and in the world of journalism. And it is the world of journalism that I want to talk to you about today, because that is the world you are about to enter in just a few moments. For me and for people in my generation, the world of journalism was completely defined by economics, by a completely, is that okay? By, <laughs> very sensitive, by, by a completely terrifying kind of existential crisis around the business model of being a journalist. When I arrived at the New York Times in 2005, we very much wondered whether there was going to be a New York Times when we were done. Within a few years, our stock price had fallen to $5 a share. As President Trump would say, not good folks. <laughs> Layoffs followed, buyouts followed. To stay afloat, we actually sold 19 floors of our own building, the floors that we worked on inside the New York Times. And you know the story of what was going on here. Free online content, a free fall in the advertising market, they all conspired and they completely decimated our build. They completely decimated our business and they decimated the business of our rivals. And it was a full-blown crisis. But you also know what happened next. The New York Times made a very significant bet. We invested in quality journalism. We invested heavily in quality journalism, despite those business problems. And then we created a paywall. And it turned out that people would fork over money for really high quality journalism. So much so that today the New York Times has more subscribers than it's ever had before. Most of them are digital. That stock price went from $5 to $35, and we are buying back those floors that we had to sell off. That is worth applauding. So in short, we have begun to solve the business crisis. And you are very, very welcome that we did that. <laughs> But what we did not anticipate, what we could not anticipate, was the next crisis. And that crisis is your crisis to solve. And it is a really big crisis. That is the crisis of trust. It is the crisis of people not believing what you report, what I report, of finding that the work we hold so dear, what we believe to be the great calling of our lives, is fake, fake news. Because when you walk out of these halls, and it doesn't bring me a lot of pleasure to say this, you won't just become journalists in this moment. For many people, you will become the enemy of the people. That's just a reality. So welcome to that not so great club. <laughs> I want to talk just a minute about this phrase, enemy of the people, because I can still remember when President Trump first invoked that phrase. And I remember my reaction to it. I shrugged it off. I shrugged it off because it was introduced in the most casual way imaginable, in a tweet 
on February 14th, 2017. This was what the tweet said. It said, the fake news media, failing NY Times, CNN, NBC News, and many more, is not my enemy. It is the enemy of the American people. The president concluded this tweet with the word sick, capital, and an exclamation point. A little known fact is that 16 seconds later, he deleted the tweet, he reposted it with a few revisions. He got rid of the word sick, he saved five precious characters. If you use Twitter, you know that's a big deal. And he added the name of two more news organizations, ABC and CBS. In preparation for this talk, I went back and tried to figure out the story of that tweet. What would prompt the President of the United States to brand the news media the enemy of the people on February 14, 2017? And as you all know from your work here at the J School, any investigation worth doing starts with a timeline. And here's what I found. On February 9th, five days before the president sent that tweet, a federal, appears court, a federal appeals court blocked his travel ban, which had blocked people from five mostly Muslim countries from entering the US, something that we covered very heavily in the media. On February 13th, the day before he sent that tweet, the president's national security advisor, Michael Flynn, resigned after it was revealed by the news media that he had misled his colleagues about conversations he'd had with Russia. This was a very tough week for the president. And on February 14th, the day the president sends that fateful tweet, on that morning, he clears out everybody from the Oval Office, the vice president, the attorney general, his son-in-law, everyone except for FBI director James Comey. He sits James Comey down. He condemns the media to James Comey. He tells James Comey that he wishes the FBI director would put more reporters in jail for running stories with leaks. And he asks the FBI director if he can take that case against Michael Flynn and please let it go. Comey does not let it go. A few hours later, the president sends out this fateful tweet about how we are the enemy of the American people. Now, if this were the daily, this would be the moment I would play some music and I would let you consider the president's motivations for using that phrase, enemy of the people. But, and boy, is it raining. But to understand why this phrase this phrase, enemy of the people, why it cannot be shrugged off the way I first shrugged it off when it was written. You have to go back, as any daily listener knows, to the very beginning. And in this case, that's the French Revolution. <laughs> you ready for some really bad French? En me, en me de pomp? Enemy of the people. <laughs> During the French Revolution, that was anybody who betrayed the revolution. They were tried in the Revolutionary Tribunal, and if they were found guilty, they were executed. That was the enemy of the people. This phrase, it next appears 130 years later in the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin, where it's applied to those who oppose his socialist revolution. Those who are marked as enemy of the people, guess what happens to them? They go to jail or they die. About a decade later, in Nazi Germany, enemy of the people is adopted by Adolf Hitler's propaganda czar. It becomes a pretext for genocide. There's a quote from Joseph Goebbels, if someone wears the Jewish star, he is the enemy of the people. It is around this time that the Chinese dictator Mao Zedong begins to use this phrase to identify and publish his enemies, who he labels as class enemies of the people. I don't have to tell you what happens to those people. That is the incredibly, exceptionally dark history of a phrase that on February 14th of 2017, in a tweet, the President of the United States applies to the United States media. It's a really serious phrase. In each of these cases, a leader uses this phrase for a very particular reason, to generate the broadest possible dislike of and distrust of a group of people seen as an obstacle. For President Trump, that obstacle is the news media, which brings me back to you all. Because like it or not, this strategy of the presidents that begins with enemy of the people, it is working and it is working alarmingly well. Today, 72% of registered Republicans in the United States, they tell pollsters that they would rather get their news directly from President Trump, from the government, from the state, than from the news media, 72%. And how do we know that the president's language is influencing that? Well, nearly half of Republicans, 
47% of them say that it's more accurate to describe the media as the enemy of the people, that phrase, than it is to say that the media is an important part of our democracy. Nearly half of Republicans think that. And if the media are the enemy of the people, why should we trust them to tell our story? So that's pretty bad. It gets just a little bit worse, because I, I think I haven't given you enough pessimism just yet. <laughs> the distrust that I'm describing, it's trickled down from partisans to moderates. That's good. That should scare the crap out of you. Nearly 30% of independents now say they'd rather get their news directly from President Trump than from the news media. So this crisis, it will define your careers and it will define our country because it endangers the very idea that there's an objective truth. And if there's no objective truth, how do we solve objective problems? We can't even agree on those problems. So it all kind of grinds to an ugly cable news shout fest kind of a halt. So by this point, you're probably thinking, Barbaro, this is the most thoroughly depressing commencement speech <laughs> that anyone's ever delivered. Congratulations on your first and last commencement speech. <laughs> so I hear you. I, I really do hear you. But this speech is about to take a turn. It's about to take the kind of turn we take right after an ad break in the daily. <laughs> because I absolutely believe that there is a way out of this trust crisis. I believe it's because of the experience I had creating a new kind of journalism with my colleagues at the Times over the past few years, an experiment that you now know of as The Daily. The Daily was born in this world of enemy of the people. We created the show in February of 2017. I keep repeating that time frame because that's when the tweet came out. We're arguably the first enemy of the people news program. And it profoundly influenced the kind of show and the kind of organization we would be. And for me, that started with a necessary admission of my own fault, my own role in this moment. I was a political reporter throughout 2016 covering Donald Trump's presidential campaign. And if I was being honest, I didn't understand what was happening. I thought I did. I wrote all those big sweepy stories you see with the capital letters above them in the New York Times on the far right of the front page. I didn't know what was going on. I kind of hid behind the conventions and the rituals of modern journalism. But in a way, I was telling the story as I thought the story was to be told. This wasn't conscious. It never is. But I learned a lot, and it was humbling to admit it. When we created The Daily, I was asked to be its host. And that admission was incredibly present in my mind. So what did we do in response to this understanding of where we were and what we had done wrong? The first thing we did was we dispensed with what I like to call the voice of God authority that has long defined so much of modern journalism in print, in broadcast, in almost all parts of the industry. It's this version of top-down journalism where we hand you the story and we expect you to be grateful for it. We give you polished, sweeping prose without much insight into how we actually found the story and why we decided to tell it the way that we did. We decided at The Daily to build transparency into our storytelling. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we decided to use all that unpolished raw material, the vulnerable moments, the journalistic uncertainty, the stuff you almost always toss to the side when you make the finished product, and we decided to put that front and center, to embrace it, to make it as central to the story as anything else. Our very first guest on The Daily, our very first episode, featured a man who told us that he did not trust us to tell his story. His name was David Green. He was the CEO of Hobby Lobby. If you've heard of that company, it's probably because it was at the center of a Supreme Court case involving the Affordable Care Act and contraception, and a requirement that he provide something that he believed contravened his religious beliefs. And as the conversation started, this is what David Green told us. He said, do you know how many contraceptives we provide to our employees? 16 of them. This is what he said, quote, you'll never print that because it doesn't fit your narrative, does it? But we did publish it. It was one of the first things anyone who ever listened to The Daily heard. It heard a man telling us he didn't trust us to tell his story. But we trusted the listener with that reality. We didn't hide it. 
And the fact that we nevertheless engaged in a thoughtful conversation with this man who didn't trust us created more trust with the listener. The second thing we did was we made sure that the people we talked to, that they were the absolute subject of everything we did. We elevated the people we talked to in a way that felt empathetic and non-judgmental. And that sounds really simple, but so much of traditional journalism is actually about the journalists. It just is. It's not supposed to, but it is. There's that great moment from broadcast news where one of the characters says, let's never forget what the story is really about. It's about us, not them. <laughs> He's being sarcastic, but, but I believe that message has been sadly lost on many journalists. We decided to frame the stories by using as many of the words as possible from the people that we were talking to. Because we realized there was a central flaw in the way that we frame stories and we tell stories. Because in this familiar version of journalism, the people that we thought were the subjects of the story, they become very small components of the story. Their stories are filtered through us, their words secondary to our words. You hear that complaint so frequently in journalism. You squeezed me into the story that you wanted to tell. It breeds suspicion and it breeds mistrust. We wanted to change that. In one of our earliest episodes, we spoke to a man who sold guns, a man who sold guns that were used, in one case, in a mass shooting, Virginia Tech. I can't think of a less sympathetic human being on earth that you'd ever want to hear from than somebody who sold the semi-automatic weapon that was used to kill a dozen or more students. For all of you, you'd think that must be the most simple narrative imaginable. You want to hate that man. You want to not really think of him as a human being. It turned out to be one of the most complicated, revealing interviews we ever did. It was not a simple story. This was a man who wrestled deeply with what it meant to have sold that weapon, who was full of regret about it, who tried to square what had happened with his own fundamental belief in the Second Amendment. It was one of the most surprising conversations I've ever had. And people who listened to it said they never wanted to hear from him until they did. And they suddenly had a very different view of everything about it. It's because we didn't slot him into a narrative, and we listened to him, and we let him tell a story. The third and the final thing we did, keeping your rain expectations realistic, was that we decided when journalists would come on the show, my colleagues at the Times, we would encourage them to be real human beings, not these polished robots you see on television, not these disconnected writers you sometimes read in the newspaper, these impersonal voices, we gave you episodes like the one that featured my colleague, Mike Schmidt, now the recipient of two Pulitzer Prizes, despite the fact that he's my age, under 40, this seasoned national security reporter who calls us from inside a Kinko's because that's the nearest place he can find a hardline phone to reach us. And from Kinko's, he tells us about James Comey's dinner with Donald Trump in the White House and a pledge of loyalty sought by the president and not given by FBI Director Comey. In this conversation, you can hear the employees at Kinko's asking Mike for the phone back <laughs> because it's not his phone to use. And in that moment, the possibility that Mike Schmidt is the enemy of the people feels very, very hard to accept. He's not the enemy of the people. He's Mike calling in from Kinko's. He's real. He's flesh. He's blood. He's a hardworking, tenacious reporter finding a way to tell the story. When you put all these elements of what I think we've done well at The Daily together, what I think you have is a new way to think about rebuilding trust. Trust from the consumer of the journalism and trust of the journalist delivering the story. It's not a solution. No one thing will ever be the solution to the enemy of the people problem that we now live with. But I think this is a kind of roadmap toward a solution. And what the world of journalism needs now, more than perhaps it's ever needed before, are experiments in the creation of greater trust, bold attempts to repair what has been very, very badly frayed over the past two years. It needs, and I say this humbly, it needs more dailies and it needs what comes after the daily, whatever that may be. And I don't know what that's going to be because you're going to have to go create it. You haven't yet created it. You don't know what it looks like. 
but my challenge to you is to go and create it. Create it over and over again in as many ways as possible. And when you do that, just keep a few things in mind. To rebuild trust, you must be humble, you must be human, you must be empathetic, you must be uncertain, and you must embrace that uncertainty, and you must be listening, and you must make the listening part of how you tell the story. That is how we will disprove those dangerous words, enemy of the people, by forging a new kind of trust with the people that we cover. The future of this industry very much depends on you creating these new forms of trust. I wish you all the best. I wish you more than just luck, because the stakes are really, really high. And I'm going to be watching. I'm going to be reading. I'm going to be listening. And I'm going to be cheering you on as you create that trust. Thank you both. Thank you all very much.